Welcome to In the Envelope, a podcast from Backstage, the number one resource for actors and talent seekers. I am your host, Jack Smart, awards editor at Backstage, and I'm here to guide you through every aspect of the entertainment industry with the help of some of your favorite stars. These intimate, inspirational conversations with today's most award-worthy film, television, and theater artists provide you, dear listener, advice on how to live the creative life, personal stories of success and failure alike, and maybe, just maybe, a tantalizing glimpse in the envelope. I'm recalling from memories all the time. I'm a library of memories. And that's basically what I am. I, I am content. And the content in my head is my life. Welcome, listeners, to another episode of In the Envelope. We are a month away from the Oscars here at the end of March. I can't believe it's the end of March. And I also can't believe that award season is pretty much still going strong for another month. But I also kind of don't mind because I like this extended period where we get to speak to a lot of really amazing award-nominated talent. Today's guest, Bill Camp, being the prime example. Bill Camp has been called Hollywood's most valuable supporting actor, I've read that he, since 2011, so in the last decade, Bill has appeared in 31 movies and 15 television shows. And he's sort of one of those actors where if you know who he is and you see his name in your in your credits of a, of a project, you're going, oh my gosh, I can't wait to see what he does with that role. He's going to either steal the show or just or lend himself to this story in the best way. He's the most reliable character actor out there. He is one of the most reliable character actors out there. And in fact, his wife, Elizabeth Marvel, is another one. She's someone who I'm also just obsessed with. Anyway, Bill is now nominated. He's been nominated before for awards, but here he is getting not a SAG Award nomination for The Queen's Gambit, which is Scott Frank's chess drama starring Anya Taylor-Joy. It's a very hit limited series on Netflix. And Bill Kemp's performance in it, I find it so, it's so worthy of a SAG Award nomination. I'm so glad that SAG recognized him because Like many of his performances, it's a pretty small role in terms of screen time. Bill plays Mr. Scheibel, who is the janitor and the person who teaches Beth, the main character of The Queen's Gambit, chess, for those who haven't seen it. And young Beth is played by this child actor named Isla, I believe it's Isla Johnston. And um, these scenes are extraordinary. And Bill Camp is then pretty much only in about an episode and a half worth of camera time. But his impact is huge and his quiet, responsive performance ends up creating kind of the whole emotional arc of the series. Uh, I, I actually got emotional speaking to him about it at one point. This interview is a great way of highlighting the work of a supporting actor, the work of an actor who thinks like an ensemble member. Bill comes from the theater. He was born and raised on the East Coast. He went to Juilliard. He worked mostly in theater for many years. It's only recently he's become more of a film and TV actor. And um, we're going to link in today's episode description and the article for today's episode to a Backstage 5 Bill gave us uh, about a year ago. One of his quotes in that is, basically every actor's task is to remember one's lines and listen. And I love that quote. Uh, I think this interview sort of expands on that and gets into what is listening, what is responding and using silences in one's acting stage and screen, and what is this idea of heightened? How do you heighten naturalistic performance, or how do you heighten a piece of material? Bill is an is a pro at all of this. And I was so thrilled to include him. As you'll hear, I am completely nerding out throughout this whole interview. And uh, let's take a quick break and get to it. And please, listener, do stay tuned after this interview to hear again from Backstage Casting Insider, Christine mckenna Torella. All right, let's take a quick break and get to it. For your awards consideration, the HBO original series, The Undoing, starring powerhouse actors Nicole Kidman and Hugh Grant, both nominated for their leading roles at the SAG Awards and whose performances NPR hails as magnetic and GQ calls superb. 
The thriller challenges viewers to examine the notion of truth, finding themselves blinded to the reality that was right in front of them all along. The Undoing, now streaming on HBO Max. Bill Camp is what's known as a character actor, appearing, or more like disappearing, into many memorable supporting roles. The Juilliard-trained stage star, Tony-nominated for The Crucible, has given countless TV performances, Emmy-nominated for The Night Of, and can be seen in Lincoln, 12 Years a Slave, Birdman, Molly's Game, Wildlife, Vice, Joker, and this year's News of the World. He is now SAG Award nominated for his work on Netflix's hit limited series, The Queen's Gambit. Here is the wonderful Bill Camp. Bill, I am so happy to have you on this podcast. How how are you doing? Are you back in New York? No, I'm, uh, th and thank you for having me on your podcast. Of course. It's a real thrill. Um, I uh, am in Pittsburgh at the moment. Oh, okay. In a hotel room. Yeah. Oh, are you? Um, can I ask? Are you filming something? I'm filming a television show for Showtime. It's called Rust. Okay. And we started. We were supposed to start a year ago, and we got like a day in or so, and and then uh, you know the delay is just turning into. Two more weeks, two more weeks, and then three months, and then eventually it was a year. And so we started up again a couple of weeks ago. That is so crazy because I, looking at your just so prolific resume of the last couple of years, and I, I kind of imagined in my head, this guy must work all the time. But to hear that it's been exactly a year, right? It's, a, it's exactly one year pretty much to the day that you have not. <laughs> yeah, similar to maybe some years prior. <laughs> This year was Which, different. of course, I want to ask you about. Yes. On some level, yeah. you know, I did a couple of Zoom things. I did a radio play for the public theater and mm. a Washburn play. And uh, I did a Zoom cast of a Samuel Beckett short story uh, mm. for to raise some money for Theater for a New Audience in Brooklyn. And uh, mm. my wife and my son and I made a short movie for Maven Pictures that hopefully will be seen sometime soon. Yeah. Um, and uh, and then we kept busy with uh, with other sort of in-house creative projects. So yeah. So yeah. <laughs> Take us back to the very very beginning. Was it has it always been acting? Were you bit by an acting bug? No, I mean I I uh, I did some plays when I was younger, when I was really young, you know, uh, and like fourth grade. <laughs> awesome. Uh, and then. I had a teacher and who was uh, my fourth grade teacher, and then in fifth and sixth grade. I mean, it was a, it was. This is we're talking about. Oh my gosh, I can't like early seventies, mm -hmm. and yeah, like seventy two, seventy three, seventy four, and uh, there was an open classroom movement, uh, oh, cool. which yeah, in the in the public school systems, and uh, there we did a lot of plays. And then awesome. we started a community. This guy, this this brilliant man, a teacher, um, started a, a children's theater, like a community theater for kids in in Groton, Massachusetts, and surrounding towns. And we did some, we staged some really awesome, you know, musicals and plays and original stuff. And, hmm. and then, uh, and then um, I did a, I did a, I played the boy in a professional production of Waiting for Godot. And then, oh. Oh, I don't know, I was 10, 11. Yeah. And, uh, and then I didn't act at all until I got to my senior year in high school. Mm -hmm. And I did a, played Giles Corey in The Crucible. And then, because for me, it was just, you know, it was, it was sports and other gotcha. recreational activities. Sure. <laughs> but, that became really my focus. And then in college, I was a classics major. And in order for me to make any money up there for through financial aid, I, I chose to work in the theater department in their scene mm. shop. So I, oh, cool. I, I got, got an in there through the technical side of things. And then 
you know, me and some friends sort of in charge of the building and the department. And I had one friend in particular who was a genius in many, many ways. And so we then uh, he put together um, Aesop's Fables as a mm-hmm. as a road touring show that we would do through the University of Vermont. And we did that a couple of years. And uh, I was sort of in and out of school at that time because then I also was a uh, they had a local uh, IATSE charter up there in Burlington, and so mm. I, I was on that charter, and so I was a stagehand in that. I started to make good money doing that, mm-hmm. and uh, we would put our own plays on, and that's cool. Slowly but surely, it it evolved, uh, and I auditioned for the Shakespeare Festival uh, up there the next year after being a carpenter, and I got a couple of small roles and. Then I got offered a free ride at the University of Idaho and uh, their theater department, oh. which was quite quite good. And, and then my dad and I talked about it and my mom and was like, no, nah, I don't go to Idaho. Okay. And right. at that time I was, I already knew New York uh, mm-hmm. as a high school kid going down to like uh, cotillion parties and stuff. Okay. And because I I went to a school where, you know, a lot of kids lived in New York. And And were you seeing shows when you went? Not at that time. No, I did see some shows as a kid, but but nothing on Broadway or anything Uh like that. Um, But then when uh, I was in the art department and taking a class at UVM and uh, the sculpture teacher brought us down to New York on a trip and uh, she took us to the Worcester group and Mm -hmm. I saw us like the third production of Swimming to Cambodia (laughs) down in the performing garage and and uh, then went to go see Balm and Gilead that uh, that uh, Steppenwolf and Circle were doing together and uh, I saw that twice and uh, my mind was sort of like uh, just kind of opening up, you know, okay. all the stuff that was possible. I see. And uh, in a theater, and then I really right. was like, okay, this is what I'm, <laughs> this is what I'm going to really focus on. This gotcha, yeah. And that's when you know this teacher of mine at UVM in the art department was like, you should get out of here, okay. and I, <laughs> and. Uh, and then I talked to my father about it, and he was like, well, why don't you go to the best schools you can possibly go to, because you should probably go to a school, because my father was an educator. You ah. know? And uh, I agreed with him, and so I auditioned for a bunch of schools and and then chose Juilliard, and that was the beginning. Side note, did you ever use backstage or read backstage, maybe for casting notices? No. I I would read the magazine, but I didn't look for anything. I mean, when I was in school, sure, it was, uh, it was, it was, you know, it was the magazine to look at. So of course, it was in the, it was in the, in the dressing rooms at Juilliard and like on the floor in the hallway, and you know, so so sure. And there would be, um, I would suppose, some things might go up on a board on the fourth floor where the offices were, or in the hallway. Mm -hmm floor at that time uh, outside of the dressing rooms, you know, Mm -hmm. and where most of our classes were, there was a a board near the schedule, but but we were not encouraged. We were discouraged uh, from pursuing anything professional outside of the, if, you know, in those four years. Right. They were pretty serious about that. Yeah. There were some people that... uh, Paid no attention to that. Oh, and some people who <clears throat> who really did, and I fell in the latter category because I I somehow knew enough that uh, I shouldn't put my toe into that place That's right. <laughs> because it uh, it was good. Those those were focused years for me. Uh, yeah. You're certainly kept part. busy for those four years too. You don't necessarily have time to. Yeah, I'm really good with structure. Jack, same. Yeah, left my own devices. Uh, uh, I can deviate, and I can be distracted. <laughs> you know, and so I've spent a lifetime doing that. And yeah, uh, and I think unconsciously I knew somehow. Oh yeah, yeah. There's this is really good for me. Yeah, cool. And 
I, and I dug it. I really, really did. I, I really loved it for about three and a half of the four years. Oh, no. Yeah. Uh, no, but I think that that's a good <laughs> fun. You know, it's a, it's yes. a long time to be in a conservatory <laughs> setting yeah. you know, with the same 16 other people oh, yeah. and in the same hallways and the same, you know, uh, and there's, you know, I hate to, there's no air in that building. <laughs> Yeah, and mm-hmm. windows, and yeah. at least back then, and so, um, but a privilege to go. So, yeah. and a privilege and a great opportunity. And I, uh, you know, I'm still. It's you know, it's cliche, but I still learn, relearn stuff, and I'm in touch with okay uh, a couple of my teachers oh, from cool. still who awesome. I go to for advice and help and. Like specific advice, and even do you talk almost coaching for specific roles? Sometimes. That's so cool. Okay. Because I was going to ask, like, what are the takeaways? Are there things that you still do for all of your roles that stem directly from Juilliard training? I think just the way that I, I approach, like, the way I've learned how to take those first steps mm. towards somebody that I'm supposed to play. Gotcha, yeah. You know, the initial questions that I'm asking. And then from there, it's sort of, uh, I mean, it's hard to say which comes first, the chicken or the egg, because sometimes, you know, it shifts. Sometimes it's a physical thing. Sometimes it's a purely like interior, uh, mm-hmm. meaning it's an idea or it's, or it's an image or it's somebody else. And then what I can do is I can integrate whatever those ideas are, um, whether it's the way somebody speaks, if it's the way somebody speaks, then I have all of these tools that I was given as an actor at Juilliard over the four years because speech and and voice work is one of, I think, uh, two things, three things that actually you carry through every year, every week of those four years. You're doing a voice class, a movement class, and Alexander. And so, um, you know, those are all things, those three things especially, uh, I can I can apply and I can think of and, and use as tools. And one of these teachers that I do, you know, still have a relationship with and, and I love him so much, uh, not only because of, you know, how he's, how he's led me and how he's guided me and, and the information knowledge he's given me, but also I just I just love him as an individual mm. and as a friend. And uh, it's, it's vocal work, it's speech mm. work. It's the stuff that comes out of my mouth and how it comes out of my mouth and how that, you know, just the thought and phrasing and, and all of it, you know. Um, and then uh, once I do that work, I can let it go. So it doesn't become cool. Do you know, it's like otherwise it's very self-conscious sort of stuff. But it's it's taken a long time in my in my in my work career uh, to be able to really confidently do that. Gotcha. To actually happen. You know, it's because uh, I used to try and apply all this stuff and it was just it was overly conscious self-conscious so <clears throat> but but yeah and that goes for everything you just said goes for theater and film right like you is it also safe to say the transition from screen to uh, from stage to screen also happened especially at one point um side are you side note do you consider yourself mostly a screen actor these days when are you going to go do no. theater again no. <laughs> <laughs> I just did a piece of theater. I did Zoom theater. I mean, I yes. don't know what category that falls under, but it was right. a, a muscle and a and a, you know a craving that I that I uh, most always have. Huh. <laughs> I'm always enticed by it because you know uh, that's where I learned pretty much everything I know. Yeah. Uh, in a beginning stage, and then it moved into this different form. And so I had to learn how to take what I knew in the theater and, and, and almost like the confidence that I had had gotten working so much 
in terms of practicing, 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 practicing in the theater and being able to slowly integrate that into the arena in the form of now three cameras and gotcha. 55 people and all sorts of stuff and in and, and that world and uh, the size of it and mm. really, you know, really the eye of the camera. But, and that awareness, you know, that kind of awareness. Um, but no, I always think of myself still as a theater actor. Mm-hmm. I love acting for the camera. I love being on, on sets. I love telling stories in that form. Mm. But I think, uh, yeah, I don't know. I might get back to the theater. Uh, I'm not going to say, there's something that's, that's uh, <laughs> maybe in the works. Okay. We'll see, but... <laughs> No, definitely. I'm a theater actor. Yeah. I'm a theater actor that that is is uh, blessed to be able to work in film and TV as well. Sure, sure. And that process, like you said, it's a slow learning of just becoming more confident, switching gears to the three camera kind of format. Is there anything you wish you'd known? Like, do you have advice for? I'm thinking of it is specifically the theater actors who are quote unquote transitioning or learning how to do the screen acting version? Well, wow, that's a great question for my wife and not so much me <laughs> okay. I need to articulate that, but <laughs> you would answer it like that. Um, yeah. What advice could I give some? Uh, we'll be sure to book her next also on the podcast. Yeah, you should. Absolutely. I guess. See, it's a difficult thing because uh, because one has to feel it's a very fine edge. It's one has to, uh, for me at least, I'm only speaking for myself. For mm-hmm. me, it's like being on a, it, it's a knife's edge. And I have to care and I have to not care. Ah. And uh, there is a certain freedom and a, and a kind of liberation and, and a sense of play that I was able to achieve uh, um, in the theater, you know, that, that grew over the decades. Hmm. And and I needed to. I think at first I was I was really I was I was uh, I was afraid to sort of bring that kind of freedom to to the to the to the the camera and 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 all of that. Now I was always uh, criticized or or at least given them evaluated as a somewhat hyperbolic actor in my <laughs> youth and very big. So I had to really tone it down. <laughs> Gotcha. Uh, when it came to being on camera, um, so uh, I would say, I would say, um, just listen and do mm-hmm. everything that one has done uh, in the theater, but just know where the cameras are. Just be aware. Okay. You really only have three audience members, and those are the three cameras or the one camera, and that's it. Gotcha. Those three eyes are watching you. None of the 50 or 60 other people, none of the people mm-hmm. sitting at the video village, none of the you know people watching the stream, streaming dailies, not the boom guy standing over your shoulder, not even, you know, you have your partner mm-hmm. and you have these however many eyes are watching you, which rarely gets more than three. Unless... Yeah. unless doing some action sequence, you know, with <laughs> lots of four different cameras. Sure. So there, those cameras are your audience. Are they also sometimes or always your scene partners as well? Yeah. Cool. Oh, yeah, totally. Especially there, if there's like a direct address moment. Yes, which I really enjoy. At first, I, it's a funny question because I didn't, I love going right down the barrel. I've only done it a few times in in uh, you know commercial productions, TV, mm-hmm. uh, a movie, and then I think I got caught in that movie. Um, it was a great idea though. Uh. Um, and then uh, I don't know a couple other times, and then I had to do it for this Samuel Beckett piece, right? First Love, I did. And I had three different laptops in a room, which I manipulated for, you know, and had, we had a great design team. Wow. I was in a, in a room in our house in Vermont, 
And uh, yeah, it was really cool. It was it was really cool. But I had to address most of the time the green dot, right? On yeah. The t- and that was a bummer. And it was <laughs> it was really hard, Jack, to get used to that. Hmm. And so then I started to put little things like little stickers like a zebra or an elephant next no to it. No way. So I was talking to the elephant or the zebra, so I had a target. <laughs> You know, because I couldn't look at this thing because um, I didn't have anybody. Yeah. And it was interesting. I'm not sure what the psychology is and it doesn't really matter. But uh, looking down the barrel of a, of a lens, like a real lens of a $200,000 camera was different. That was okay. exciting. But in this form, it was very different. So, interesting. Anyway. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's a that's a great observation that that yes, that lens is it has to be my partner. It cannot be my enemy. For your awards consideration, the HBO Max original series, The Flight Attendant, starring SAG Awards nominee Kaylee Cuoco, whose performance Entertainment Weekly calls phenomenal and The Hollywood Reporter raves is a star turn for Kaylee Cuoco also SAG Award nominated for its ensemble and hailed by Variety as a glossy, twisty, energetic murder mystery, The Flight Attendant, now streaming on HBO Max. What is your relationship with using your personal experiences in characters? Like, do you ever use sense memory or how much does the imagination play into creating a character? Yes, and a lot. Okay. (laughs) So yes, absolutely. (laughs) sense memory because I'm using in a way uh, I'm using sense memory all the time and that was you know I I just sort of I'm recalling from memories all the time I'm a library of memories and that's basically what I am I I am content and the content in my head (laughs) right is my life and people that have been in my life and the events of my life. So it's full of that. So so that happens, you know, more than I would wish <laughs> sometimes, <laughs> you know, more than like it's 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 uh I wish I could shut it down sometimes. Yes. You know yeah. what I mean? I'm not Absolutely. talking any kind of like I just think that's the way human beings function. I think yeah. that's uh that's that's what, you know, people are meditate in order to shut it down. Uh yeah. and so So that's happening all the time. So when I get to, that's what the beauty of, you know, how lucky am I? I get to then use that Hmm. in order to to, uh, tell some other person's story that I might be able to to contribute to, to, you know, by by using my own, I get it out. I get to sort of like, I get to explore it, in other words. I can become curious about it. And I can say, oh, this works. Oh, it's, do I remember this? Do I know what this is? And I'm an old enough man now, I think, with uh, you know I, a lot of experiences in my life that uh, that I that I will cho- choose from. And that sure. was something to go back to Juilliard in my first year. Probably, you know, maybe the most important teacher, acting teacher I had at that school was a gentleman named John Sticks, and that was the first. The first class we took was Sense Memory in our first year. And John was a brilliant, 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 brilliant acting teacher, at least for me and many of my classmates. And uh, and and opened up that whatever that key was in order to access the memory and Mm -hmm. all of that sense memory stuff for, you know, lack of a better term but the imagination is also part of that they exist very close to each other Hmm. you know because sometimes we embellish what our memories are and sometimes so 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 then my my imagination is sparked by that too because i also want to like maybe i don't want to remember something the way it actually happened maybe i want to change it which is also Hmm. a superhuman thing to do (laughs) I mean, it's a common human thing to do. And so yes. my imagination is also being used, right? Almost at the same time. They're so mm-hmm. close. And one, I think, I think, you know, you know, Edward Bond was somebody that I 
started reading after I did a play of his with Robert Woodruff. Um, and I started to read everything I could of Edward Bonds, his, his poetry, his prose, his essays, his you know political thought, all that stuff. Um, not everybody's cup of tea, but one thing that I really took away from him and his, his, uh, his idea of theater is that, yeah, it's just basically imagination. And so uh -huh. that we, as we get older, sometimes may lose our imagination, but as children, hmm. You know, so in a way, I'm 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 still doing what I did in fourth grade that that started when I was a fourth grader and a fifth grader and a sixth grader, and it started to you know, that's unkind. I had no idea that's what I was you know going to do, but it was something right. I really uh, you know that started happening then, and I'm really fortunate that it did. And imagination is you know that's that's it for creativity and. And uh, for me, at least, I always want to make sure that I don't stifle that imagination. Yeah. You know, repress it in some way, suppress it. Yeah, it's beautiful. I mean, that goes back to what you're saying about you don't want to just cultivate yourself as an actor or just become an actor. You got to have life experiences to fuel all of that. And um, yeah. also what you're saying about freedom, you're trying to capture freedom on camera or on stage, right? Pretty much. Yeah, I, I wanted to be as free as I wanted to be. I wanted to translate in that way because then that will invite whatever the, whoever the observer is, right? Because I think we're all attracted to that on some level, to the freedom or the or the you know. Um, I mean, there's a great there's a we could go on for hours and hours about well, well, how does that? How do you? What does that look like on a stage? And and yeah. and what is the you know our, our our different tastes in terms of what uh, what that means to us, uh, and that's great. And there should be different you know tastes as to what freedom is. Is it naturalism? Is it kitchen mm. sink? Is it like, but what it, or is it a kind of? My belief is that the theater lives in a place which is a little heightened. It's a little bit heightened, but yeah. it's it it's a combination of it has to be. And this is one of the great things that I learned from that particular teacher at Juilliard and John Sticks and movement teachers and Judy Leibowitz and so many there was that there was, uh, and it will continue to hopefully I'll learn from all of that stuff, sure. that it's a, it's a, it's a, it's an integration It's synthesizing and knitting those, those, the natural, but also, so it looks effortless. So it looks like this person's behaving totally like a human being and natural. And I can relate to that and I can lean into that and I can mm -hmm. engage with that because I, de I identify that or I'm really interested in that. And at the same time, it's got to be a little bit, you know, that's my right. opinion. That's yeah. my opinion. And that's what makes the theater really interesting to me. Because you actually physically sometimes once in a while experience that in a theater in a room with 800 people or a room with 35 people, you know, you feel, you know what I'm talking about. You're in a room and suddenly the room just kind of goes. Poof. Yeah. And it's because what's happening on stage, but it's also what's everyone's listening. Yes. It wouldn't happen if people weren't listening. <laughs> and so it's it, it's this. It's this, uh, you know, this exchange, this kind of, mm -hmm. what it, I don't want to say economy, but it's like we're all in it together there. And sometimes it actually, it, it, it happens and you can literally feel the room and the air in the room change and it only lasts for a little bit. Oh, yeah. And then it, it doesn't get sustained. I mean, I don't know. That's my experience. I suppose there are productions and people that have sat in theaters where from the get go to the very end. You know, but that may be just because one person was doing that, that walked on stage and you couldn't, you know, somebody was the center of the storm the whole time. And, but it has to be everybody happening yeah. at the same time, including the audience. That's wonderful. It, it's that freedom, I guess, that that we're not really even conscious of. Yeah, it's a it definitely a subconscious thing. I've never quite heard that put that thought. First of all, I miss theater so much. You speaking about theater right now, I, I just miss that live theater experience so much. 
but um, it is listening. It's when the audience is really, really listening too in that way that the, it's that leaning forward towards an experience or a, or a delivery that you yourself can relate to in ways that you can't always articulate. Yeah. That's what I'm like crave. That's what I'm missing from <laughs> my life. Yeah, it's a physical experience. It's a really, physical. you know, I think that, uh, you know, if we allow ourselves to experience it in that way, yeah, and like you said, it's it is freedom, but of course it's structured. It goes back to what you're saying about you need structure, and the script and the direction those give you the structure. But otherwise, you are trying to harness, also like a childlike imagination, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah sure. And then that's exactly what it is harnessing that. And it is true, like so in the theater, heightened is a little bit easier to grasp, or it's a little bit easier to kind of chart because you also are literally heightening your performance to make sure it reaches the back of the theater. But that maybe this is where I can ask you about the Queen's Gambit because like, is that, is Mr. Scheibel heightened? How is he heightened? That's such a perfect example of like, how are you ta taking your theater training and using the heightened thing just for the three cameras and just with your one scene partner? I think it was, he was paying attention. I think yeah. that's where the heightened thing came from because uh, and how much attention he was paying yes. you know, young Bath and that nobody had paid any real attention. Mm -hmm. I mean, he's in a place, right, where where is he? He's in an orphanage mm -hmm. and he's he's in a place where people aren't really paid. They've lost anybody to pay attention to them. They've either been discarded because people didn't want to pay attention to them or they, you know, they like Beth lost the people who were supposed to pay attention to them but couldn't because they were too self-oriented or whatever it was, too caught up in something else like, you know, her dad and his studies and her mom and her, you know, her tortured mind and but infatuation with the dad and whatever you know she certainly did her best but i mean she offed herself and so left her kid yeah. in the back seat and was gonna actually you know probably let beth die but mm -hmm. so so the amount of so i think that was i think that's all i really needed to do one yeah. I, I i trust you know scott inherently i was like i was there because of him and were there because i knew uh, i wanted to be a part of something he was making because hmm. he's a master he's like a storyteller genius and and understands you know the form that we were working in so uh and given the fact that mr scheibel was who he was and where he was and hmm. And that we may think, oh, he doesn't say much or what have you, that there are limits on him or that there's, I mean, the first time we see the guy, he's playing chess by himself. Yeah. And that that in itself is a kind of like, there's something about that. I mean, now I know people <laughs> play chess all the time because sure. they, but, but uh, it's an interesting thing. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and. So he's he's clearly like wants to use his mind, and plays close attention to, uh, you know, uh, the game, which is a little bit like war, and the relationships of what's happening and the values of each of the different pieces and all of that stuff and whatever you know memories he's playing in his own mind at that time. Yeah. What are the things going on in that guy's head? Uh, why he plays and and why and anyways so the relationship with Beth I think yes was the heightenedness was sort of a uh, was 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 the attention he gave her yes and that in a place that was where there was no attention being given yeah and and that uh, of course you know he sees something quite as he says, astonishing in her, but hmm. but he was willing to make that, I mean, that to me was the moment that was when when he allows her to sit down. Yeah. I mean, it sort of just sort of passes by, but to me, that was that was a big moment when he allows her to sit down yeah. and play, and he has the willingness, he shows the willingness, right? 
or the generosity of spirit to sit like, yeah, sure, you know. That is heightened. Like, uh, you know, he knows it's not a great place up there for her. Yeah. I, I think, you know, it can't be that enjoyable, <laughs> right? It must be hard. Maybe he sure. knows why the circumstances are not, but, uh, and he admires too also her, her steadfastness, but mm -hmm. the heightenedness was, I mean, that's, that's the really cool, awesome challenge that I have is just that to, to try and achieve that kind of thing in stillness. In stillness, yeah. In silence, you know, yeah. because we don't pay much attention to that a lot. And I think it's just as much a part of, of sound, you know. Yeah. And those questions you mentioned, like how much of the, uh, what memories is he thinking of? Like how much of his, his, of his past did you create or did you discuss with your collaborators? Um, do you do a lot of like backstory work? Uh, <clears throat> when I feel like it's necessary, there was a little bit of conversation that Scott and I had. There's not a lot uh, provided in the book itself. Hmm. Uh, so I certainly had that opportunity to do. Uh, but I also felt like, you know, it, again, I didn't want to distract from the attention that was going towards her. It was about her. And, and whatever, uh, uh, there are a lot of things that I can leave to the imagination, yeah. right? The observer, because there's a responsibility that lies there, too. Hmm. It's not my responsibility to have to, you know, even even try and hint at like telling a little bit of a story about something. I mean, there are a lot of people that do that. Yeah. They like, and I really envy them because, but I also don't want to distract because my number one, you know, the bottom line is that I get hired to tell uh, really just a, a, a piece of a mosaic. And so I, I, mm. I the story was her story. And the story yeah. was at that moment at that particular moment was about Scheibel's relationship of uh, uh, passing on knowledge to this this young woman who was he saw going to be a great, had the possibility of beating everybody in the effing world <laughs> because he saw her brilliance. Mm. He had no idea, you know, why it was happening or that she was, you know, hallucinating games on the ceiling and all of that. But yeah. but he saw that, you know, she could, she, she could, you know, kick everybody's ass. And so that was the priority. That was the that was his job. That was my task was really in that 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 little bit was to try and impart what he could to her. Yeah, I feel like there's really there's great advice in there. Like you're, it's spoken like a true supporting actor. Like you you approach this and maybe many other of your roles as I am a puzzle piece in this overall story. And in particular with the Queen's Gambit, um, there's even a reading of that whole first episode is actually Beth's, older Beth's memories. So it's almost more impressionistic anyway, right? Of like, this is a character in her life who has come in to teach her something. You as an actor are not approaching it as the Mr. Scheibel show. And I am the main character and here's everything I know about it. <laughs> and, right? Yeah, I don't want to do that really. Yeah. It's, it's just too it's extraneous right it becomes superfluous and yeah. and 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 uh you know a waste of time because eventually yeah. there will also be you know i could come up with a thousand and one ideas you know to bring mr shabal as you know he docks this way because this and that and he smokes a cigar and you know he's got a big scar here because he you know <laughs> world war one and blah 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 and all that you know whatever yes. And and so, or yeah, or or insist on certain props over here because they just sometimes that's uh, that's really interesting. And I and I work with like I'm doing right now with Lester Cohen, who's the production designer of this show I'm doing down here, who I know from Night of and Looming Tower, and mm -hmm. he's a very very good friend of mine as well as a you know we collaborate. And so he helps me when I may think, or he asks me questions cool. in his design. So it's like, is this gonna, and, and I'll, you know, it's like, yeah, yeah, maybe this, maybe this, but, um, but no, it's all, it's just, if I was to, 
if I was to do that, some for me, there are some brilliant actors that do that stuff, and and right. it all works. I I I can't do that because I'd end up having the director cut all the time or say, you know, we do five takes and then you'd be like, you know what, let's lose that thing. Let's lose that thing. So that I just waste everybody's time with, sure. with that kind of stuff. So, but yeah, really the bottom line is there. I'm, I'm to serve the story. I'm there to serve also, like you said, it's not Mr. Scheibel's story, it's Beth's story. Yeah. And, and so again, it's about listening and paying attention. Mm -hmm. And that's all that really matters. And then the other stuff is, you know, it will happen. And, and I like to allow a certain level of imagination work on the audience. Yeah, I, I love this idea of you're giving the audience, you're trusting in the audience. And it goes back to what you're saying about they're listening to, they're almost a scene partner where they're listening to that, that truth in you. You are trusting them to fill in whatever blanks are there and there's blanks for every character because nobody's walking around giving exposition about i was in the war and then i got this scar because you know that's not that's not what any of us do in real life so of course it's not going to happen in a in a story you trust the audience to interpret your your performance you know impressionistically however they see fit however they see themselves mm -hmm. yeah yeah and i think that's what uh, it kind of happens when we read books right or we read yeah. play um reading a play it's like that that's a more imaginative experience it's kind of exercise right as an as an an, an event uh, to, to fire one's imagination uh at least that happens with me and uh and in really good stories and so as a char as a as a as a character in a story that we do get to see either two-dimensionally or three-dimensionally, there are things that I want to, yes, I, I think it's the responsibility of, you know, and if they take that responsibility, the observer, the audience, if they take it and they're willing participants in the whole event, then uh, awesome. That's how it should be. And then there are some people that aren't and they're not going to participate and they're there for whatever other reason. Yeah. yeah, this it's all you're tying it all together. It really is like um, what you just said is also an answer to the question: How do you transit a theater performance into screen? Because it's that same idea of like distilling a heightened, structured yet freedom for the screen in a way that's like every silence and every reaction shot is charged. I mean, one of the questions I often ask is like, how do you look at silences or screen or stage directions versus dialogue? I, is it safe to say you you treat those with the same reverence and the same intense focus as you do lines of dialogue? Well, maybe more, maybe more. I mean, it totally. may change. it may change at some point as I get older, but uh, uh, it's. I think it makes people uncomfortable. I think that people it <laughs> it makes it's a it's an it, it's that's in a way I can I feel and I could be completely off base with this. But I feel like if it's orchestrated or if it's composed in a way, right? Mm -hmm. It can't be random and it can't be overindulgent and it can't be, you know, just like just like, you know, dialogue, just like text. But <clears throat> if it's used correctly, uh, it's it's uh, it's super powerful. It's really really powerful, and I think that it gets people's attention. I have to let you go soon. I could talk all day. Thank you so much for all of this nitty gritty actorly stuff <laughs> um oh thanks jack can i ask you one last uh very backstagey question that i believe we have asked you before but um what is one performance you think every actor should see and why oh my god you have asked me this before <laughs> and i get so <laughs> and it's such an impossible question is there maybe something you've seen recently like uh in lockdown yeah, we saw this brilliant performance of a woman in, and, and I thought it was a great movie, um, St. Maud. Did you see that? Um, no, I've heard about it, yeah. And it's kind of a, it, it's, it's kind of a take on St. Joan. Morphid Clark? Yes. Yeah. I thought she was brilliant. Cool. In, incredibly brilliant. You know, I also recently saw um, Sidney Poitier with uh, 
Rod Steiger in the heat of the night. Hmm. I think both of those yeah. in that movie are, are, you know, they take that sort of thing about realism or naturalism, but they take it up here. Yeah. Where the energy between the two of them and, and what each of them, like, you know, they both, that's, that's that happening on a screen. Cool. You know, between these two individuals. Mm. And the young woman in that movie, like every second, every, every moment for all three of those performers in those two different, and very like different, totally different, different mm. times. And shot so differently. And the director of that film, St. Maud, that's her first film, I think, or her second. Yeah. He was, she's brilliant. Just, just yeah. brilliant. There were so many things in that movie that I, I loved. Um, well, gosh, thank you so much. Thank you. Congratulations on your SAG Award nomination. And I'm sorry I didn't say that at the beginning of the interview. I'm so, I'm so happy. I'm so happy for you. I'm so excited for you. Thank you so much, Chuck. I appreciate it. And now it's time to hear from Christine McKenna Torella, our backstage casting insider. I will let her take it away. Hi guys, Christine McKenna Torelli here. This is part two of my State of the Theater conversation, and today we are covering the U.S. Actors' Equity Association and the current public dispute between the members and leadership. I've simplified some of this because, um, well, I think it's going to be a changing and ongoing situation, so I've simplified it for clarity and time today. It all started a few weeks ago when Equity released new protocols about getting back to work. And amongst those rules were private transportation for each actor going to the theater as a requirement and putting up members that did not live alone in hotels for the run of the show. And these two seem very cost prohibitive for actors getting back to work. Also, if actors sing on stage, they must be 12 feet apart with plexiglass barriers between them. And other actors can't face the singers when they are singing, which might seem creatively prohibitive. Tempers are short here and people really want to get back to work, understandably. And this led to actors in the union writing an open letter to equity delivered to the union last Tuesday. They feel unheard. They feel left out. They feel they're further behind than any other industry when it comes to getting practical protocols in place. So a lot of frustrations here. The actors, A, feel like they have not been consulted about these decisions and protocols. B, they see that other unions like SAG-AFTRA and Equity UK have been arguably more flexible and been able to get their actors to work. And C, they want a town hall and a dialogue to begin. So over 2,000 equity members signed this letter and it reads like a who's who of Broadway. A few days ago, Equity responded to this open letter with a Medium post. They said, watch out in the days ahead. We will announce a town hall that will allow you to learn more about our safety protocols and get your voice heard, especially as vaccines become more widely available. Equity highlighted the following actions that have been benefiting their members this year. So the union have worked with theatres to get 120 live shows with or without the audience in the room up and going for this year. Equity has developed new media agreements for COVID and those have been used 700 times. Equity is lobbying the state to prioritise art workers for vaccines as capacity restrictions are lifted in some venues. And their argument is that science and health officials lead their decision making. So the fact that Dr. Fauci is expecting mid-fall of 2021 to be the likely time for theater's full return, that's what they're working with. I'm not commenting here on who is right and who's wrong. That's just an outline of the conversation of what is happening and what's going on. It certainly helped me to sit down and explore these points of view. I can't wait to hear more. And most importantly, I can't wait for theatres to get back up and running on the great, bright way. I highlighted some really great theatre opportunities during part one earlier this week. And there are hundreds of current casting calls for every type of actor in every region on Backstage.com. So head over there to explore those opportunities. Break a leg in all your upcoming auditions and have a beautiful week. Envelope 
is recorded at Lotus Productions and Hyperbolic Audio in New York City and Soundbox LA, Mark Rao Studios, and Buzzies in Los Angeles. Thanks as always to our producer extraordinaire, Jamie Muffet, and to the team at Backstage, Samantha Sherlock, Mark Stinson, Caitlin Watkins, and of course, Casey Howe. Visit Backstage.com, and don't forget, you can subscribe to Backstage by using the code ENVELOPE at checkout for a free trial. That's right, 100% free. For more exclusive content, join us on Facebook and Twitter at In The Envelope, and subscribe, share, and leave a comment. Who would you like us to interview next? Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you next time for another glimpse in the envelope.